<laughs> we should be live right now. Uh, let me double check and make sure that, yes, YouTube says we have an excellent connection. And uh, yeah, today I'm here with a special guest. I'm here with um, the Thunderous One. And yeah, say hello, Thunderous. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And um, thank you, Lloyd, for having me on your show. You're very welcome. No, thank you. Uh, I first heard you speak on uh, Reason Dances Apologetics. Uh, you spoke on atheism, which was to me mind opening. Um, you know, the, your, the, your knowledge of the subject, the way you laid it out. And of course, you spoke on Islam. And yeah, that's why I wanted you on to introduce some of these topics because these are serious issues within Islam. I mean, we view them as amusing, but, but really, these are issues that Islam has no credible answers for. And these are part of the just just part of the process of removing these these foundations of islam and, and hopefully watching it crumble as people realize how false it is but yeah if you can introduce yourself um yeah sure so um i'm thunderous one i'm an ex-muslim i've appeared on um several um youtube channels i think we've actually first met several years ago lloyd um on yeah. uh, another channel um we lost communication with each other then we found each other again so to speak on um, Thaddeus channel and um and here we are now, um, continuing our um, dismantling of Islam. You certainly come with an absolutely fantastic, unique perspective of the deep, deep history of Islam and Islamic teachings. Um, I certainly can't follow your footsteps, but I've come with a different angle, something that's um, right. a slight dismantling of what they teach. No, I think I think your angle is correct because, quite honestly, when you look at Islam, it it comes across as myth not as history it looks as it comes across as myth and narrative and you're approaching it i think from that perspective and you're, you're doing shall we say an archaeological survey of this myth and narrative and finding does it match within within our knowledge of archaeology history facts and logic yeah i, w I was motivated in fairness by um, stop spamming who did um, a discussion on um, the inheritance breakdown and how the numbers don't stack and I got right. me to think that I can use that kind of um, the numbers don't stack and apply it to other Islamic teachings um, as, as the demonstration is going to be tonight. All right. Yep. Will you be sharing your screen at all? Uh, uh, no, I won't be. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> come on. Okay. No, just, just checking in case I needed to on grab my iPad. Sorry. Everything's on my iPad. Okay. Now, if you had a PowerPoint or something or a Word uh, document. We could have I would have allowed you to share the screen, but that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, so so guys, um so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh I hope to finish this with by not later than um seven thirty PM. Um that's Eastern Central Time. Uh, Central European time. Uh because of course I want to do the terminology uh show at eight PM European Central Time again, which is in ninety minutes. And um and I need a break between the two to do some things. So guys, please, if you have questions, please ask. And um, yeah, so we'll, we'll try and finish this in the next 54 minutes at most. And, um, and, I, and I will let you know, I do hope to have, um, within a few weeks, I do hope to have Thunderous One on again, because there's some interesting topics that I think are worth examining, worth discussing. And um, you know, he's, he's the best person to speak about some of these things that I've heard so far. So yeah, Thunderous, if you want to take it away. And guys, please ask questions. Okay, everybody. So um, tonight's discussion, I would like to present to you um, a hadith um, that uh, many Muslims don't like to talk about because of the mathematical implications, and that is Islam and the 124,000 prophets. So what I'll do is I'll just give you the hadith first. It reads, um, okay, so this number comes from a hadith in Musnad Iman Ahmad, narrated by Abu Umar al-Bahili, relating the conversation that Abu Dar had with the prophet, to translate. I said, O oh Messenger, how many prophets were there? He replied, 124,000, from which 315 were Jama Gafira. So the Hadith teaches that Allah sent 124,000 prophets. Now, only about 25 are mentioned in the Quran, all names originating from the Bible alone. Thus, there is a deficit of 123,974. Muhammad has to be included in the 124,000. So some of the questions that we could you know, ask ourselves are, or what Muslims should be responding with are, who are they? Where did they live? What did they write? Did they live 
concurrently or did they live consecutively? Why are they they're not mentioned? Why are their names not mentioned? Where are the books they revealed? What were the books they revealed? What do these books say, teach, reveal? What languages were they revealed in? What languages did these prophets speak? What lands did they go to? I think those are all reasonable questions to ask. And one could also ask, why is it only that prophets mentioned in the Bible, which Muhammad supposedly had access to, why, why only them? Why are none of these other prophets named, none of their texts named within the Quran? And of course, within the Sunnah, let's say. I, I, on that, that's a very good question you've asked there. I think the reason why only 25 are named uh, is because one has to b bear in mind that Muhammad was a traveling salesman. So as a traveling salesman, he would have likely encountered other religions, other cultures, other political ideologies on his travels and thus accumulated the names right. as such. Majority of them being from Christian, Judeo-Christian backgrounds. So those would be the names he could remember because those were basically the main religions he was exposed to. Also want us to bear in mind that when Muhammad started his preaching, who was his target audience? None other than the Jews and the Christians. So logic dictates that one, the 25 names are biblical because those were the ones he was speaking to or uh, spoken of or heard stories of. And two, the Jews and the Christians were his audience. Right. Was he trying to convert them and thus to convince them of his prophethood? There is, uh, if he's going to appeal that he's come from the lineage of Abraham and that he's following the same religion of mon monotheism um, and he's saying that he's a prophet that's been mentioned in their scriptures then logic dictates he has to appeal to them. He has to get his audience. His audience are going to be those that are going to be familiar with the narrative that he's claiming to uh, be in succession of. And he's also saying he's the seal of the prophets. So right. he has to appeal to Jews and Christians. You've just mentioned something, and uh, XYZ said, did Muhammad even exist? Now, now, until that question can be answered definitively, I, I'm not really willing to, to dig in there. I mean, I can have an opinion like anyone. But, but until that's answered definitively, and it's very hard because obviously the records, I think, deliberately vague. But you mentioned, Thunderous, that he's from the line of Abraham. At the moment, um, there's someone called uh, Historical Christianity in the channel, and he sent me some information. And uh, guys, I need to thank you all. Um, so many of you have sent me very useful information, be it names of books, be it um, little pieces of information that, that have really opened up some doors for me or tied to two seemingly disconnected pieces of information together. And, and also those who've, uh, who've offered some contributions, thank you, thank you very much. Um, all the help is appreciated. It really actually helps take my work forward in whatever way you contribute. But so, um, but can, you said I, Abraham, I, I looked at the Abraham thing and, and it seems there's reason to suspect that he's not in the line of Abraham by no. any shape or form, but I'll move on from there, yeah? But, um, just, just on those two points myself, I don't think anybody can credibly say that um, he is from um, Abraham via Ishmael. Correct. I it, it, I, there's no evidence to suggest, and we're going to be discussing that because the lineage is a relative point to the discussion that we're going to be having tonight. Yeah. And yeah. on the subject of whether Muhammad exists or not, I, I understand it. I'm 50-50 on it. Um, when I listen to the evidence he did exist, I go that direction. And when I listen to the evidence that he didn't exist, I go in that direction. So... But irrelevant of whether he existed or not, 1.7 billion human beings believe he did exist. Yeah. So those, those yeah, we have to accept it as given, and we have to use the dates and the times and the events as as references to tie what we do to exactly. We can't just throw it away and then be left with a blank. Absolutely. So just just going to the last question that I raised here that Muslims should be answering. It says, what lands do they go to? Now mm -hmm. this is an interesting point because the further back in time you go the population of humans reduces. For example, today we have... Sure. So, for example, today on Earth, we have a population of 7.8 billion. In 1968, incidentally, the year I was born, we had 3.6 billion. And back in 1900, the human population on Earth was only 1.6 billion. And finally, just to give some kind of context, what I'm trying to get at, in the year 200, the estimated figure stands at one. 190 million. So, logic dictates that the further back in time we go, as the human population reduces, the need for a certain number of prophets, messengers per generation reduces too. 
and you'll have fewer countries, fewer. That, you know, you're gonna have fewer organized communities. Absolutely, because that that's actually one of the points as well. That, um, um, if I'll just uh, what from my, my notes, so uh, this too is a problem because today on Earth we have 195 countries, but likewise with Earth populations, the further back in time we go, we find less countries listed. For example, in 1900, there are only 77 countries listed. So logic dictates the further back in time we go, as the number of humans were fewer, thus the number of nations will be reduced too. And that's kind of like, that's in relationship to each other. You know, it, you know, if you had a family as a man and a woman, you, you know, you have several children, that, that family's going to ex extend exponentially, requiring more property, more land in order to right. exist on the human family is no different. And there are going to be examples where human beings have gone to locations that um, for a period of time were not even known to exist. You know, but, only, interesting, if you look at the mass, if you go back to the time of the Civil War in the US, there were only 2 million people in the country. Mm. I mean, so, so that's really few people. If you consider it's 340 million today, plus about a billion illegal immigrants. And there were less than 2 million people in the U.S. at that time. I mean, that's so, yeah, the Earth would have been very sparse. Yeah, so I think it's also what one should include in this as well. There is no mention in the Hebrew Scriptures of God's prophets uh, making mention of other prophets that have been sent forth with the message of monotheism to other alien foreign nations with the Mosaic law. Now, a Muslim could maybe um, say, well, Jonah did. Jonah went to Nineveh. Yeah, but that, that, uh, that line of reason is kind of stupid because it shows ignorance of the Bible because the nation of Israel and um, the Assyrians were actually quite familiar with each other. One example is the Book of Esther. The Book of Esther shows that the Assyrians wanted to wipe out the nation of Israel with the contention between Mo, um, Mordecai and Haman. Now, Jonah going to um, Nineveh was because they were a city of bloodshed. And he didn't go with a message of monotheism trying to convert them. He went with a message, and anybody can read this in the four chapters of Jonah. He went there with a message saying, if basically God's going to destroy you unless you change your actions. So he did not go with a message speaking in their language. He spoke in Hebrew to the Ninevites saying, repent or you'll be destroyed. They repented. That is the message. That wasn't a message of a prophet going there trying to proselytize. And there's something interesting in this as well. They repented. What does that tell you about their knowledge of the God of the Israelites? It kind of shows they had some exp historical experience with, them, uh, with the God of the, um, the Hebrews because they responded to it. If it had been Zeus or Apollo or Superman, they wouldn't have responded because they would have known anything about them. Very interesting, yes. So, you know, and another thing as well, you know, when we're talking about the further back in time you go, the number of nations reduces. So you've only got to look at India. Once upon a time, it was India. But now India has been fragmented into Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kashmir and Bangladesh and India. So you're from one country, you've now got five. So historically, we can look at this as well. Um, I did want to make mention of something else as well. So on a side point, the media and education system and possibly the vagueness of some statements by political commerce and science and education give the impression that the world is uh, overpopulated. This is a blatant lie and, you know, that we could discuss that maybe another time. However, I make mention of this as language creates pictures in people's minds, thus resulting in mental images of metropolises abounding everywhere in the past when, in reality, the further back in time we go, humans were in fact very sparse, scattered, and separated on the earth. So this is another thing as well. When, when we look back in time, when we look at, say, certain Hollywood movies, let's say Gladiator, you get the impression that the world was very condensed and living in certain lo geographical locations, when the reality is the world was very scattered, and so human beings were very scattered and sparse. There were metropolises and world empires, certainly, but that's not strictly true. Many countries and locations are isolated as well, without communication from the rest of the world. So that, that kind of like needs to be borne in mind as well with 124,000 prophets. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Okay, so if Mohammed was a prophet, the final prophet, the role for all mankind, um, then why is he not mentioned as well by any of the, uh, by name? by any of these other prophets that have gone to these other nations. And that's another thing Muslims need to try and reconcile. 
no other country or nation historic, historically, when you consider the importance of Muhammad in Islam, ever makes mention of this one man that's going to come as the seal of a prophet. So you've had 123,999 prophets go to the rest of the world since Adam, and not one of them has mentioned Muhammad, yet he's supposed to be the most significant of, of them all. So just moving forward then, the 124,000 prophets is a significant number. Islam cites the Torah, the Psalms, and the Injil as canon. Mm -hmm. But considering the bastardization between the Bible and the Quran, Muslims simply have no choice but to resort to Muslim default of the Bible as being corrupted. So how are Muslims going to break down the figures? And this is what we need to get to. How are they going to break down 124,000? No other books are mentioned by Muhammad as he does not know of their existence. Likely if he existed, of course, he's making this up as he goes along. The right. Torah, the first five books of the Bible, has no genealogy. And, you know, you, Muslims wouldn't go there anyway, because, and if they did, you'd have to... I have to... a question. Are, are all the prophets mentioned in just the five books of the Torah? Or are there additional prophets in the other books that are not named in the Torah? Oh, um, the Torah is the first five books, yeah? But... I know, but are there prophets that are, that are outside of the Torah within all the other well, books? Well, from a biblical or Judeo-Christian standpoint, absolutely, Jonah was um, uh, Isaiah. Isaiah is not mentioned. Because, uh, because the Quran technically or specifically only references the Torah, does not recognize any of the other books of the Old Testament. No. Which no. means then, so if Allah only knows that, then, you know, how do they get the names from the other books? Well, this this is this is the point. I mean, the only mention. The, well, I, I when I've had this discussion before with people, mm -hmm. the, the, he's mentioned basically the main ones that are referenced. When when you're speaking to say somebody of the Bible, normally in a normal conversation, you're naming the main ones. What I call the big hitters: David, Solomon, mm -hmm. Moses, Abraham, yeah, or maybe Isaiah. You're you're talking about the big hitters. Malachi is not spoken of, is he? Jonah's not is very seldom mentioned. I mean, mm -hmm. Jonah may be Correct. mentioned because of the situation and the likeness, you know, if you like, of um, Jesus being dead for three days and, uh, and and the sign of Jonah. But other than that, the, the minor prophets aren't mentioned. It's always the big hitters that are being discussed. And I think this is why when you look at the Quran, you're only getting the big hitters mentioned. You're not getting the minor prophets mentioned, who too serve under the same God, sometimes as contemporaries, you not you don't find Daniel mentioned in the book of uh, in the Quran, do you? Correct. You know, because basically, when you think about it, Daniel's speaking of a contemporary time, but most of the information that you find that's re that's in the book of Daniel is only talking about today. People would have read Daniel in say Muhammad's time, but there's no material in the book of Daniel in Muhammad's time that had a relevance for Muhammad's time. So likely people didn't talk about Daniel that much because the material wasn't relative. Daniel particularly talks about the last days or the world powers going up to the last days. Well, maybe they left out those prophets that, that would give Muhammad a hard time, that would pr pr provide a contradictory narrative to what Muhammad was preaching. So maybe he left those guys out. There's a possibility. I mean, if he's trying to reinvent Islam in his image, and we've had this discussion before, mm -hmm. if he's trying to reinvent Islam or monotheism in his image, he's going to take those big hitters, as I call them, and mold them in his own image. He's going to mm -hmm. take them and bastardize their image into his own image. So that could well be the reason why. But just moving forward, then, it says, like, the Torah has no genealogy, the Psalms has no genealogy either. Then we come to what's known as the Injil. But in Islamic theology, the Injil was a written book given to Jesus by Allah, of which no copy exists. So no genealogy to see or read there. What we do have, though, are the four gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, this is a mess in itself for Muslims, because if the Injil is a separate book, a book that simply has no proof of ever existing, then how are they going to establish genealogy? So Muslims, via some Muslims and their scholars, obviously I'm including, via some desperate and peculiar form of osmosis and, cog osmosis and cognitive dissonance, are going to resort to quoting John 14, 16, thereby implying at least giving tacit authority to the Gospels. Yet they'll shy away from genealogy of Jesus, just as given in the book of Luke. Now you, you're all probably thinking, why am I going on about genealogy? What has genealogy got to do 
with the discussion of 124,000 profits. And in a moment, that's all going to make sense. So I, I mentioned it as though it's irrelevant. But when you look at um, the book of Luke, chapter 3, Jesus' genealogy from Adam to Jesus is 73. Bear that in mind. Jesus, so Adam to Jesus is 73 generations. Muhammad was born in 571 AD, 540 years after Jesus. And we know for certain that there was no other prophets after Jesus, unless Muslims can prove otherwise, as the Quran mm -hmm. makes no mention of any between Jesus and Muhammad. So there is a void of Allah provided right. prophets for 540 years. This is a significant point. Islam has no genealogy in any of its sources. All its claims are invention, fabrication, lies, or good old-fashioned bull excrement. So how can we make sense of this? Well, using the internet and research tools, we can see what Muslims are saying. The line of descent we are looking for is Adam to Muhammad. The names are mostly irrelevant, as most of them will be invention, or they will just cite some Jewish names so as to legitimize the illegitimate prophet. Muslims have no choice but to cite the usual suspects, obviously Adam, Noah, and Abraham, and then proceed to invent the others. However, they have provided a different genealogy, and without exception, all Muslim sources have Islamic genealogy from Adam to Muhammad as being 21. Think about it. 21. Adam, Adam to Jesus is 73. And we've got that list in the book of Luke. I think there's one in the book of Matthew as well. One goes from Mary's lineage to David, and the other one goes from Joseph's lineage to David. So when a Muslim says, well, you've got two genealogies, one contradicts the other, the simple response to that is one follows the, um, the historical narrative from David to Mary's um, lineage uh, and genealogy, and the other one is from David to Joseph's uh, lineage. That's why some of the names differ. It's not a contradiction. God made a prophet to David that from his seed. So the promise was fulfilled. It's a desperate lie on Muslims. Just an interesting point there. Anyway, moving forward. This is a pathetic demonstration of desperation. Most of the names are fabricated in the genealogy anyway. So the compilers may as well have invented, um, may have made up a, a number that makes sense. After all, once you've started lying, why stop? So I think the point I'm trying to make there is, once you've started lying, what difference does it make? You've now invented a genealogy for Muhammad based on nothing. You've, you've extrapolated it from thin air. Why stop at 21? Surely somebody must have realized this at some point and thought this just doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we've got the genealogy of Jesus being 73. Why have you got who, up to Muhammad from Adam, who's 540 years later, only 21? That's a very strange number. It should be more. It should be it should be seventy four or something like that. Well, no, it should be not ninety. Even yeah, exactly, because it's five hundred years, so it's a number of other generations. Yes, it should be about another, say, twenty, thirty generations in that. Right then. Yeah. So, um, where, where, where are we? If Christians had made up the number of 24,000 prophets, we can calculate or an average for the whole human family on earth by dividing the figure by 73 generations of to Jesus' genealogy. However, the Bible, sorry, the Bible makes no such ludicrous claim. Therefore, trying to make sense of it, I'm simply help, trying to help Muslims out. So to understand, to, to make sense of this, we have based uh, on the Hadith on 23,909 prophets from Adam till Jesus, Muhammad being the 124,000th prophet. So what we've got to do here then is 21 generations, but Muhammad, so Adam was one generation. Jesus was one generation. Muhammad was one generation. So you have to take those three generations away from 21 and right. you come to number 18. Yeah? Right. If, right. Also, in the Islamic parlance, Adam was a prophet. Ma Jesus is obviously a prophet, and um, Muhammad was a prophet. So you have to take those three from 124,000, and you get 123,997. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So 
18 generations from Adam being the first prophet and Muhammad being the last means we have to divide 123,997 prophets' messengers by 18 generations. This gives us a figure of 6,889 prophets per generation. Let that sink in. Say the number again, please. 6,889 prophets per generation. 6,889. Wouldn't there be some historical record of that many? Well, the, 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 I was going to elaborate on that later on. Um, but the thing is, bear in mind that that's per generation. So Adam was the first prophet. There was no other contemporary for Adam other than his wife. So the next generation obviously would have been their children. It would have right. required um, Adam to have tens of thousands of children in order to have 6,889 um, prophets in, this, in the next generation. I, this is being generous, though, um, when you think about it, Lloyd, because if I reduce the figure, what does that mean? I'm increasing the figure elsewhere. That's mm -hmm. what it means. So I'm trying to average this out. So helping Muslim out again, let's assume that each prophet lived as the previous died, and assuming that the average service lifespan of each prophet was 10 years, that is to say, 10 years serving as a prophet. Biblically, Jesus only had a three and a half year ministry. Mm -hmm. This would also um, a figure from uh, this would also give us a figure from Adam, Islam's first prophet, and, uh, and incidentally, ninety foot tall. But that's another subject. Yeah. So well, what, you know, within within the Bible, is Adam a prophet? Because I don't not, think so. Not in a, no, not in a, nobody would have seen Adam as a prophet because in what in what sense would he have been a prophet? He would have been just the father and first man of all men. And a prophet to whom? To his wife. Yeah, exactly. When they were talking directly to God, like. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> but the thing is, you see, yeah, but in Islamic parlance, though, Lloyd, you know, Adam fell out yeah. or he was kicked out of heaven, wasn't he? He was in the spirit realm first and then he came yes. to the physical realm. You know, th th that's a subject in itself as well. Right. Um, so, Muhammad, the seal of prophet, so, so if you give each prophet, say, a 10 year lifespan as a prophet, now, as an example, Muhammad served 20 years as a prophet. In, in the biblical narrative, Moses, I think, served. How many was it? 80 years as a prophet? That's still 1,240,000 years. <laughs> that, that's, you've worked it out, 1,240,000 years. And that in itself is a problem because then you have to divide 1,240,000 1, by the generations to understand the times, you know, like the, how, how, the, how long each person would have lived then. Yeah, so Muslims have to explain if they were sequential or, you know, if they were... If they, were, if they were, if they were, if they were, which was contemporaries of each other, then you have yeah. six thousand eight hundred eighty-nine prophets. Per generation. Yes. Otherwise, but you've got they... you've got <laughs> a million years to explain. <laughs> Good grief! They've got problems. Yeah, a million, a million, what, one, one point two million over twenty-one generations, though. Good That's grief. the problem. You've got to remember from Ad, from Adam to Muhammad is 21 generations. So 1.2 million over 21 generations. That's the, that yeah. comes to 59,000. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I've got I've got that figure down there as well. You've, <laughs> you've, been, you've got there as well. Excellent. So reducing the service years of each prophet to one year would still have 124,000 years of continuous service of prophets. So if you have one prophet serving a year, then he does his year, another one takes over. He does a year, another one takes over. He does a year. That still has 124,000 years over 21 generations. That's incredible. And biblical history doesn't extend more than, what, 5,000 years? Um, 6,000 years. 6,050 years, I think, we're at at the moment. Around about wow. 6,040. In the Jewish something. calendar, that's... Yeah. I mean, there's no way that... Yeah, so this, these numbers are... Okay, yeah, clearly clearly doesn't make sense or even by being generous to muslims and giving them a total of 43 generations so i've taken 21 i've added another 21 and i've, and I've plus the one as well so 43 so it's 21 21 plus one generations from adam to muhammad will equate to 2883 prophets per generation this figure simply does not fit with the number of countries nations at the time in pre-jesus uh, or earth's population of humans Simply put, the numbers don't stack. Now, the, a Muslim could just turn around and say, well, that's a weak hadith. 
Yeah, but you and I know lawyers. They do and... actually. That's their major defence. Oh, I can I can go into that later. Yeah. Yeah, but but weak adif is not false adif, is it? If it's Correct. weak, it's still true. A weak is still true. In fact, it's more true than false. It's more likely to be true, and therefore it's not yes. false. Especially yeah. if it's a prof, if it's a, if it's a hadith about Muhammad, and in fact, different scholars rate them differently. One may make it sahih. Yeah, exactly that. You see, you get, you see. So when, so the arguments that they use against it don't work. And the interesting thing is, the only person that's going to turn around and say it's a weak hadith is who? It's the person or the Muslim that you're standing in front of saying yeah. this. To. In fact, there's another set of hadiths that state that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah sent eight thousand prophets. 4,000 to the children of Israel and 4,000 to the rest of mankind. Yeah, I saw that one as well. That's and in Muslim Ahmed. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, th 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 that's the problem, isn't it? Because when you start going into those realms, even, even that doesn't make sense. But the thing is, 4,000 to the nation of Israel, that's just, how did you get that? Where did you get that from? But the thing they is. They made it up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, one, oh, I just want to comment on this as well. It says that none of these so-called holy books sound anything like each other. The Bhagavad Gita sounds nothing like the Avesta. The Avesta sounds nothing like yeah, the Yeah, you'd think they'd have a consistent message, right? They would all be teaching a similar message if they're exactly. from Allah. Yeah. Right. And the, 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 the parallel I'm going to use is, is Noah's flood. Now, if 123,999 prophets had gone forward with the same message, we would see some consistency in the books that they claim to be holy, right? And logic dictates in Islamic parlance they've all been corrupted. You know, with no evidence, they've just been corrupted because they don't agree with the Quran. Yet there is another narrative that abounds around the world. It's very similar, not the same, the details may ch change slightly from one to another, but in principle it's exactly the same, and that's Noah's flood. Wherever you go in the world, there is an account or a narrative of Noah's world, of Noah's flood. In essence, the world was bad. Somebody built a boat. They got on the boat. God mm -hmm. brought a flood. Every, all the wicked people died. They survived. You get variations of it, but you've got a theme to it, if that makes sense. With, with the 123,909 prophets that Islam has put forward, you don't find any consistency anywhere. So, so Nathaniel just mentioned... Look, you've said that basically they're all, all these prophets went to a different nation with a different language, right, in their own region and their own time. And Nathaniel says um, they are not even close to 124,000 languages. You, it, but we're, we're being generous, though, um, yeah. Lloyd. We're, we're being generous because we've, when you use the term land, I think or nation, I think it's fair to say you can say that that, that land had its own language as well. Fine, you can go to some lands and they have one main language. I think India is an example where Hindi is their main language, but they've probably got about 3,000 dialects. But the interesting thing is, is that even when you go to those countries, they still understand the main language. But even but being generous, and uh, let's say we gave two languages per nation, the further back in time you go, the less nations there were, you know, you, you still can't have that many thousands of languages amongst that fewer nations. That doesn't make sense. And language, we've known, evolves with time. It doesn't evolve going backwards. It evolves coming forwards. Forwards, so yeah. What it dictates, going back in time means that there'll be less languages anyway. Right. Also, it says here that, um, well, what I've written down is that... Um, there is no record of these any of these prophets going with a message of um, strict monotheism. No one appearing with miracles has ever been recorded. Too worth noting, Islam considers prophets to be pure and incapable of sin. So to have no record of 123,000 plus messengers of men going forward to all these nations with no books, no miracles, no warnings, mm -hmm. and being pure human beings, because perfect. Yes. Yeah, perfect human beings, it's very hard to believe that these kind of men went forward. It's, 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 you know, when you go to a second-hand shop and you buy a jigsaw and there's pieces missing, this is like the, the brain of a Muslim and their scholars. It's like buying one of those second-hand jigsaws. There, there are just so many pieces missing that you can't see. The picture doesn't make sense. Yeah, you know, no, you're right. I mean, so there's someone in the chat who's saying that he's making little assertions and um, 
Do you know, some of the name of Brute Salbian. We will need evidence. We'll need more than assertions. Salbian. Assertions? Well, we're asking questions based on logic. Um, how can anybody reconcile 123,999 prophets with 21 generations? That is what Islam teaches, 21 so generations. So over 6,000 years, you're looking at, you're looking at a, these, these numbers of prophets. You know, if you want to look at it from the biblical time scale. And so there must be some sort of historical record of this. And where is this record? I mean, these questions, I mean, these are... And, of course, Islam, their, their major defense is, well, Allah knows best. That may well be the case, but we've discussed that as well, Lloyd. And that is that um, Islam has had 500 years more worldly experience than, say, Christianity has, being that it came about in the 6th century. So, Well, remember, there was no you... prophet, don't forget, there was no prophet after Muhammad, so that's 1,400 years, wave goodbye. And there was no prophet between Muhammad and Jesus, so that's another 600 years, wave goodbye. So that's 2,000 years gone. That leaves you with 4,000 years in the biblical time scale. So in mm -hmm. fact, you have to chop off one third of your available time and you're left with 4,000 years. But the thing is, you don't find, using the same thing, um, when, when someone says, um, well, Muslims say Allah knows best, but you don't find Judeo-Christianity responding like that. And that's, that's the point. Judeo-Christianity doesn't respond with responses like, well, you know, God knows best. We don't, nobody talks like that, but Muslims do. But Muslims have the advantage. They've got 540 years after Jesus, more history to establish its truths, it, yeah, to I establish just, these numbers. Right. I've just put this Brutus Albion character in time out because the very simple thing is that he was talking about, what about shamans and things like that in Malaysian culture? And Islam has its own definitions. We've just mentioned them for these. These people have to meet this criteria and those do not so please pay attention uh, i'm really absolutely not interested in your own meanderings and wanderings stick to the fact stick with the topic the thing is you know by by saying shamans the shamans teach monotheism no and, and the thing is as well now this is something else to bear in mind um for 1500 years right uh, from moses to jesus the only form of worship that was acceptable to God was Judaism and the Mosaic law, the annual sacrifices, the you know the the Day of Atonement, for instance, the Festival of Booths. All those things were was the only acceptable worship to God. But we only find that in the Middle East with the nation of Israel. We do not find any of these things taking place anywhere in or anywhere else in the world. Or somebody during that 1,500 year period of some of um, Israel's history of other individuals being sent by Allah taking the Mosaic law there. Because that at that period of time would have been the only um, worship God accepted was via the Mosaic law and the priesthood. Why is that not mentioned? There is a lack of detail. I mean, look, you're the expert here. I'm just following you because I'm trying to keep up with you on this. And I mean, you're the expert on this one. But, but there certainly is a lack of detail. There's a lack of evidence are they are certainly, um, you know. But the thing is, you see, it's because it's a lie, Lloyd. The, the yeah. number is made up. I think um, the, the the figure of 124,000 is quite interesting as well because um, I've done some research on this and some prophets, oh, sorry, sorry, not some prophets, I make a retraction that some scholars have said it comes from the number of 144,000. Now, you and I have discussed this. Um, I think Muhammad probably heard the number 100, uh, 144,000 because it comes from the, the Bible book of Revelation, chapter 7, mm -hmm. uh, speaking in symbolic, length, so, symbolic sense of 12,000 times 12,000, I think Muhammad probably okay. got the, the figure from there. Maybe maybe it was he heard 144,000, or maybe he heard 124,000, totally misunderstood what the context was and thought it was prophets going into the world or he's basically said that added his own twist on it. I think also when you think, when you think about it, 124,000 prophets going forward kind of really emphasizes how important he is as a prophet, that he is the seal of the prophets, that Allah sent... Ah, that's a very valid point. It's a very strong point, yes. That, that Allah sent 123,999 prophets. They've all failed, but this is the one that succeeds. Now... Do you remember, I think it's the Hadith, where Muhammad talks about Moses being very upset with Muhammad because Mah the, follow the number of people following Muhammad 
in number was greater than the number of people that followed Moses, and Moses was upset with that. Do you remember that, Hadith? I'm not sure if I actually know that one, but that, that's interesting. Yeah, so there is a hadith. That it's definitely, I've just, it's only just come to my mind now during this, this discussion that, um, yeah, that Moses was upset with Muhammad. I think it must have been on the, the Hijra when he went on the, the, winged, the winged ass to heaven, Allah's brothel. And um, that's where he met Moses. I think it's look this up. Yeah, guys, if you find the hadith, please drop it in the comments later. And uh, that's interesting. Definitely one for the collection. But this is Muhammad aggrandizing himself which would be consistent with, with everything else. With, with everything that he has done so far in his life, yeah. his aggrandizement, and, and redacting and retrospectively fitting himself in the past so as to apply the narrative to himself in the present as it was at the time. Wow, and he, man. Yeah, I mean, how does Islam square this circle? How do the scholars... I mean, I could answer that. Should, should, I've got something here from Islam QA, and... What they do is they, they talk about how the scholars differ over the validity of these hadith, calling them da'if, calling them some saying they're sahih. And um, so they quote all the scholars that call it uh, da'if, but da'if still means authoritative. Yeah. And then what they do is on more than one occasion, they say what has been narrated about the number of prophets is not correct. Allah knows best. No one knows their number except Allah. And they keep going. And then the number of prophets was 124,000. And the number of messengers was 313. And it was also narrated that the number of prophets was 8,000. And then they say here, it is better to refrain from discussing this matter. So rather don't discuss it. And they say, believe in those prophets whose names were mentioned by Allah and his messenger. And believe in the rest only in general terms. And it says here that we believe in every prophet and every messenger. But each one's message was for the people of his own time. And we believe in them in general terms. And Allah knows best. And it also now, says here that the number of books was supposed to be 104 holy books. 104. Holy I would books. like to see uh, what, 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 were the, what were these books? What languages were they? Exactly. Where did they... So, so, so there are things. Look, let's not talk about it. Allah knows best. Um, just believe in what's in the Quran. Thanks. Have a nice day. Without it, where are the answers? Where are the clear answers? Why don't, if they know everything, why don't they admit we don't know? I mean, so this is a, this is very. It's it's unethical at best and deceitful at worst. But the, the, even even if you was to take the number of um, say eight thousand per you know in Islamic parlance like God's Allah sent eight thousand prophets that's still three hundred and eighty per generation. Wow. In fact, I, I've made an error there. Hang on, it's um, eight thousand divided by eight eighteen. That's four hundred forty four prophets per generation. Even you know so whatever figure they give. The number doesn't stack. Yeah, no, it, it can't stack. So they they try and get out of it by by making these weak excuses. Look, um, don't don't question it. Don't discuss it. Uh, just accept what's in the Quran. But but I thought I thought Allah is never wrong. We're supposed to believe the whole Quran because the whole Quran is literally the word of Allah. And but the thing is, Lloyd, with that you'll you'll notice this because there is there is a um. A, a, had I had the presence of mind, I'll have brought my notes out. There is um, an ayah in the Quran that where Allah is saying, don't ask questions because they'll mm -hmm. cause you trouble. Right. Uh, if you gave me five minutes, I'll go and get the notes. Oh, no, no. no, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. I think so, we're so familiar with asking, that, yeah. in, in effect, what I'm saying is asking questions in the Quran, and it's repeated, and you get the sense of this about five or six times where you find ayah that say Allah and his messenger, Allah and his messenger. It behoves anyone who questions Allah and his messenger. It's always this 50-50 relationship. Mm -hmm. And you get the idea, do not question, just accept and submit. Yet, look at the opposite point. Look at what the Bible says. When you go to um, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, it talks about digging for things as if for hidden treasure. In the Sermon on the Mount, I think it's Matthew 7, or it could be Matthew 10, I stand corrected. But it does say, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on asking. With the Judeo-Christian um, way of the way that God wanted you to follow his, um, his code of conduct, asking questions was imperative. Asking questions was important because the more questions you ask, you get more answers and it builds your faith. Mm -hmm. Yet Islam is discouraging questions. Who would not want you to ask questions about your faith? 
Yeah. I mean, you're going to start asking, so what is your evidence for these prophets? How did Muhammad know this? Where did he get this information? Why is it not mentioned in any other sources? Which historical or other cultural sources mention this? I mean, all of this is, um, these are all very specious claims with, with no substantive basis in, in anything that we know of. And, and, and even even if we couldn't make, even if Islam couldn't confirm the validity of the 124,000, and this is the angle that I wanted to come with, even if they couldn't confirm the validity, or if they could, that's an irrelevance. The fact of the matter still stands. You've got 123,997 prophets that you've got to divide between 18 generations. The numbers don't stack. It doesn't stack historically. One through public um, population growth. Two, it doesn't stack through the numbers of countries that have come into existence as a result of the, how you move forward in time. Either or either, the yeah. numbers... And they've got 4,000 years to, to make it fit as well. That's a lot of profits they put into 4,000 years. Well, you, you, that's a lot of profits. In there. That's a lot of generations for 4,000 years, but that's assuming that... Uh, you're, you're assuming, no, I don't, I don't mean mm. that disrespectfully, but that's predicated on Islam, believing the biblical narrative of man's creation in the Garden of Eden, which is about 6,000 years plus as True, it stands. But if there were zero people on earth prior, then, then who were these prophets going to? Well, you know, yet again, if you believe, um, listen to what Yasakadi says, there were lots of jinn around on the planet, and they had their own prophets too. <laughs> There was a lot of gin, you can tell, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a whole lot of gin. There was definitely some good gin, gin going around there. <laughs> London gin, Belgium. Gin oh, good grief. Oh, good grief. That is insane. No, I mean, these, these questions, just, just the questions. I mean, one would want clear answers. You'd want definite answers. And, and the, don't forget, the Quran or Islam rejects the Bible says the Bible's corrupted, so it re would reject the Bible's lineage and genealogy. So then, where's theirs? And why did they not have one as well? If, if, if Muhammad yeah. is the most important prophet of all, you don't find this message of monotheism going out into the world. You don't find for the 1500 years that Judaism was in, in practice that going out into the whole world. And you don't find Muhammad uh, as some kind of like like you have in the mosaic law and in, in the Hebrew scriptures you have the Messiah spoken of quite clearly it's probably about 250 prophecies pertaining to Jesus yet if Muhammad is more important than Jesus there should be a myriad upon myriad references in the known world from 123,999 men yeah. going for especially if they had a consistent message if they were preaching the same message that message should be universal and it's clearly uh, not the case that that that's that that goes back to my point about why I brought Noah's flood up. Noah's flood is the only is like is is the example that um, Islam. We should have some narrative very similar to Noah's flood, that there was a world full of wicked people. God warned them. They didn't listen. So his his true people or the true family built an ark. They got on it. A flood came and swept all the wicked people away. We, that. That narrative is around the world for centuries. Even you know today we still believe it, but we do not yeah. have anything of these hundred twenty-three thousand nine hundred ninety-seven prophets. Not even like it. This goes back to what I was saying earlier yeah. on about the Ashra, the Tipitaka, or the Bhagavad Gita. Those books sound nothing like anything. Right. They don't sound like even if you was to take those books and bastardize them like they were once mon monotheism, and now you've got the Avesta. It, how perverted does it have to be that you could take? monotheism yeah. and turn it into the Avesta. It's aggrandizement. They want to claim that they were universal, that this is the religion for the whole world that, you know, and he's the one that got it right. But yeah, it, it man, it's, it's, it's hubris on a monumental scale. It's um, the, the audience is really lapping this up. I think they really, um, you've hit a few, you know, you've really hit the home run here. People are going like, yeah, we've never thought about this. And, and we need answers from Muslims. We need evidence. We can't simply, Except Alana's best, you know that red line that Yasser Qadi spoke about. We, that's your red line, not mine, right? It's mm. not ours. And the thing is, it's not just a case of Alana's best. It's a case of you know they'll they'll lie and you know wiggle room their way out of it by saying weak hadith. It, it's it's the, the fact of it is you have to be stand strong and say no. This is what your prophet said. 
I, I know it's slightly off topic, but um, mm. as an example, it's a bit like when you speak to a Muslim and you talk about Dukhanain and the sun setting in a muddy pool, and they will try and say, you know, they, they have their wiggle room of, um, well, you have to read it in Arabic because it can only ever be understood in Arabic. Okay, you know, okay then, so let's look at look at it in Arabic then. You're still talking about wajada. Wajada means perspective, all right? If that's if that's you know, if that's how you want to infer the word, because obviously in Islamic parlance, each Arabic word can have 10 different meanings. So you can pretty much make yeah. what you want out of whatever verse is in the, um, the Quran. But that's not the way we should look at Islam. For me, it's always been a case of, okay, then that talks about the sun setting in a muddy pool. The sun is a star. Let's look at all the other texts Islam has about stars. Oh, we've got one over there that says stars are shooting missiles. Oh, we've got one over here that says that the sun prostrates itself before the throne of Allah and asks permission to go on its rounds again. So clearly when you start putting all the text together of what Islam teaches about stars between the Quran and the Hadith, any Muslim that turns around and says it was from his perspective clearly does not understand Islam, he does not understand what the Arabic is himself then, and is all is clearly lying. Because all those texts, when you start referring to stars or other subjects of stars being spoken mm -hmm. of, they are speaking of something not that we know of. They have the ability to talk. They have the ability to make decisions. These are physical objects that can harm creatures in the spiritual dimension, which incidentally the Bible, I think it's the Bible Book of Kings, actually mocks when... Um, yeah, but in Islam, if you look at the Sharia, stars are, stars are objects with, with minds. Yes, exactly yeah. that. It's insane. So, it's nuts. Absolutely. So, so th th this is so. Like there, there is a principle. Um, let scripture interpret scripture. So that is to say that if you look, trying to understand something in in scripture between Genesis and Revelation, you would use other scriptures to come to a conclusive or roundabout bigger picture as to what you're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. When you're doing that with Islam, it actually makes things worse, not better. That's right. why it's always don't ask questions, don't do any further research, don't take it, you know, you find that the context, context and you're very good at this, um, Lloyd, in your past shows, you've proven this to be the case, where you stand back and you look at something and you bring out three or four pieces of material on that one theme and it gives you a bigger picture as to what Islam is actually saying on that particular subject. The same has to be done on these other things as well, even the minor awesome. things in Islam. No, you're right. I think you've raised some really powerful questions, um, th things that there's no satisfactory answers. There, there are none. And Muslims need to provide satisfactory answers if they claim this is the perfect word of Allah. So we we haven't even started on um, 90 for Adam yet. Yeah. Uh, I've got that as a discussion. If ever, you know, you want to recall me to um, the show, I've got 90. I'd love to. No, I, I need to start winding down. Unfortunately, I have to wind down to do some things and then start another show soon. But that's brilliant. Um, so, so yeah, guys, any, any last question? I, we, I, I've got very limited time. But uh, everyone seems to really, I've seen several comments where people said that this, they've never thought about it or looked at this issue from that perspective. And they see the problems in the narrative, the holes in the narrative. And uh, oh, yeah. any last comment from wind up? Yeah, it's it's, an, it's not holes in the narrative. It's a narrative with a lot of holes. <laughs> right, you're right. It's a narrative. Sorry, I, it's, said I was being facetious yeah. there, but I would just uh, on, on a final point, I would like to say thank you, Lloyd, for having me on the show. I'd like to thank your audience um, for tuning in and listening, and I hope that the material has been of some kind of benefit. Um, and I look forward to an opportunity of being on the show again in sometime in the future. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, I think in about three weeks. Um, yeah, guys, just so you know, uh, next Friday, I'm going to be uh, traveling. I'll be away for a week, so I'm unlikely to be available at all. And um, so I'm away between the 8th and the 17th. So after that, I'll be available again. And uh, yeah, we can we can chat about this, but, but this has really been fascinating. And um, yeah, we'd, we, I would love to see the sources and the evidence to back up this claim, because the answers that satisfy a Muslim should not satisfy a sophisticated audience who wants evidence. Well, the only answer that satisfies a Muslim's, a Muslim's audience is Allah knows best. best. That is the only yeah. answer they can ever have on this. No, you're right. You're right. This is actually, I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to process, you know, I'm, I mean, we spoke earlier, but I'm still trying to process. I'm like, I'm like, 
it, it boggles my mind. I, I would never buy this if I was told this. I would, I'd, I'd like, no, this makes no sense. Well, that's why they don't discuss it, because nobody would buy it if, there was spoke, if it was spoken of like this. Yeah, I know that. I mean, good grief, good grief. <laughs> yeah, there's just, it's just, the more I think about it, it's like, Islam hurts my brain. So yeah, I have to end. We have to end. But um, yeah, thank you very much for for joining us. I hope um, towards the end of this month we can do another show and discuss the ninety foot Adam, and then come on and talk about um, atheism you were discussing as well, because yes. there's some very pertinent points you've made that I think are, are very relevant. And also, it's just the methodology you bring that's worth the questions that you're asking that everyone else should um, listen to and then ask the same questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lloyd. It will be a pleasure. Well, thank you. Okay, guys, thank you. I will see you guys in about 35 minutes uh, for the next show. And, um, yeah, I hope that was interesting. I think it was incredible. So, yeah, I thank, yeah thanks to the Thunderous One, and we'll see you guys soon. Bye. Bye-bye.